when Steve Jobs founded Apple Computer in the garage of his parents' house in California in the 1970s, little did he know that he would be revolutionizing uh, three major industries, the computer industry, the music industry, and the telecom. Steve Jobs was very opinionated when it came to the quality of his product. Either the product was, was all right or it was all wrong. Either there was excellence or it was awful. You see, he had absolutes when it came to his products. He wanted um, simplicity of design and ease of use. Those were the two absolutes in Steve Jobs' world. Woe to the employee who did not share those kind of absolutes. Which is why Steve Jobs is actually a, a fascinating kind of a figure. And because of his global impact upon our world, I personally wonder if that makes him a tragic one as well. When Steve Jobs was dying of pancreatic cancer, his biographer was with him and recorded this conversation. Listen. One sunny afternoon, when he wasn't feeling well, Jobs sat in the garden behind his house and he reflected on death. He talked about his experiences in India almost four decades earlier, his study of Buddhism, and his views on reincarnation and spiritual transcendence. I'm about 50-50 on believing in God, he said. For most of my life, I felt that there must be more to our existence than meets the eye. He admitted that as he faced death, he might be overestimating the odds out of a desire to believe in an afterlife. I like to think that something survives after you die, he said. It's strange to think that you accumulate all this experience and maybe a little wisdom, and then it just goes away. So I really want to believe that something survives, that maybe your consciousness endures. And then he fell silent for a long time. Uh, but on the other hand, perhaps it's just like an on-off switch, he said. Click, and you're gone. You know what really struck me about Steve Jobs' musings? That a, that a man so black and white, when it comes to uh, absolutes on his products in his, during his life, and yet he was wishy-washy and uncertain when it came to afterlife, when it came to eternal life. Here's a man who's on the threshold of life and death, and the existence of God is at best a 50-50 proposition? Or perhaps a, a, a man's, maybe his consciousness will endure after he dies? Maybe death is just a click of an on-off switch and that's it, folks? And it's not as if Steve Jobs didn't know anything about God. After all, he was baptized, raised, and confirmed as a Lutheran. I wonder, it, it almost seems as if there's a lot of confusion these days when it, when it comes to faith. I mean, does a triune God exist? Is Allah really no different and the same as Jehovah? Just they're, they're looking at it through a, a different cultural perspective. Uh, is, is there a purgatory? What about the afterlife? And I, I, I've heard this so many times before, it's almost ad nauseum. Uh, when people come up to me and they say, you know, there, there really is no difference between churches. Because when you really just get down to the very basics, then we all believe the same. And I wonder if what they mean by basics is what? What do you actually have to get down to in order to all believe in God? Is it just that three-letter word 
we believe in God. Uh, friends, when you gut Christianity of its absolutes, Christianity will collapse if, uh, if you deny the absolutes of the faith or uh, at least deny or ignore them. But when, where Christianity thrives is when those absolutes of the Christian faith are totally embraced. And you know what? Steve Jobs, he stuck with his absolutes when it came to his product. Simplicity of design and ease of use. He stuck with the absolutes. And did you know that there have been moments in time when Christians have done the same? As a matter of fact, you, you have to go back to this very day, June 25th, 487 years ago, there was a group of Lutheran forefathers who stood in front of one of, the, uh, one of the most powerful rulers of the time in a town that was called Augsburg. And they told the Holy Roman Emperor, this is what they said. They said, we, uh, we are not 50-50 in what we believe. And those Augsburg flavored Lutherans they embraced some absolutes. And because of them, we're going to join them this morning. We're going to celebrate our Independence Day a week early. T today, what we celebrate is freedom from the traditions and the rules and the doctrines of men. But we celebrate our absolute dependence upon the absolutes of God's word. Now, we're going to turn to Isaiah chapter 55 because there are some absolutes of the faith that are found in there. Like, for example, here's one. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will freely pardon them. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Go back to that first verse that we said. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. That doesn't sound too difficult. That doesn't sound impossible. Kids play hide and seek all of the time, and eventually they find each other. So surely we should be able to be able to seek and find God, right? Who promises that he is, he is everywhere uh, with us. And especially in this day and age with all the gadgets where uh, you can talk and call and seek anybody wherever it is, even if they're a half world across. My future daughter-in-law, she can FaceTime with her parents who live in India as if they're speaking from halfway across the room. We can seek and call, and surely then the God who says, I will be with you everywhere, surely then we should be able to find him. Of course, maybe the problem is, isn't with that aspect, but how does God want us to seek him? How does God want us to call him? And you have to go to the very next uh, verse and it tells us. Well, here's how. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. And according to scripture, what are the natural ways? What are the natural thoughts of people? Oh, I warn you, it is not a very pretty picture. Even going all the way back to Genesis, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on earth had become. And that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart, they were only evil all of the time. It's not a very pretty picture what goes on in the human heart. The Apostle Paul said, the sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. You look at those words, there is nothing wishy-washy in those words. Long before Steve Jobs created absolutes for Apple Computer, there was a God who created holy absolutes 
that he gave to humans. And what is of divine excellence has been nothing short than awful for you and I. You know what the real problem is when it comes to what God says and who we are? It comes down to just this. Zebras. Zebras can't change their stripes. And human beings can't change their sins. And oftentimes, it's not even wanting to change. It's the fact that we still desire to walk in our evil ways. What does God say about that? He said, forsake your wicked ways. And yet, how many of us have been able to be holy just for a mere five minutes? Much less holiness for 50 years. God says, forsake your evil ways, and yet how many of us have been able to take even 10 steps on the path of righteousness, much less been able to walk and live it for a lifetime? The fact that we can be so overly harsh with one another in our dealings. We can be overly imaginative when it comes to our perspectives and perceptions of one another. We can be downright wicked in how we treat one another. How does that trouble you? Do those sins, day in and day out, do they really trouble you? What about the fact that we have eyes that wander, we have mouths that mutter gossip, but we do it in low decibel levels? And you think that there is not a God who doesn't see? A God who doesn't hear under the breath? And what about our thoughts? The Lord said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Thank God for that. Isn't that amazing? We figured out how to uh, put a man on a moon, and yet we can't figure out how to put a man in heaven. We figure out how to split an atom, but we can't figure out how to heal the split between us and our creator. We figured out how to map out the human genome, and yet we cannot figure out the map of our salvation by ourselves. And someday we may even be able to figure out the cure for cancer, and yet we will not be able to find the cure for our sin or its wages, which is death. And what about being able to seek the Lord, forsake wickedness? I say pigs stand a better chance of flying than we do, than all of us who were born with a natural inclination to sin, who were born without true fear of God or trust in God, and all it does is bring eternal death upon those who are not reborn by baptism and the Holy Spirit. And you know that last sentence that I just spoke, that's a, that actually is what was spoken on this day in Augsburg 487 years ago. But did you just hear in those words hope? Did you hear the hope that makes possible the impossible? I mean, think of it. Then how, does, how, do, how do the dead live? How does one uh, declared terminal, how is one then declared spiritually uh, free? How does uh, one who um, is overcome and frozen with icy hostility, uh, then how does that one become melted and warm in their feelings of God's family? Here's how. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and they do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You know, the Southwest is experiencing right now um, its worst uh, heat wave in decades. 
uh, down in Phoenix this past Monday, the National Weather Serv- uh, Service announced that it tied the record of 118 degrees and it placed it alongside an image of a, of a ball of, of fire. Uh, it's, it's been so hot, triple digit temperatures, uh, it, it persists even into the evening so that aircraft um, cannot operate because, uh, be, because they can't take off, certain aircraft. And uh, people are getting up at 4.30 in the morning in order, order to mow their lawns. Driving uh, with oven mitts and ice packs isn't uh, abnormal. Can you imagine in Phoenix this afternoon if all of a sudden there was a rain shower? And all of a sudden relief is given in the form of cloud cover and, and a little bit of a rain. You know why? Because even in the high desert, where there is water, there is life. No water, no life. The rain's coming down from heaven. Friends, no word of God, then all that there is going to be in the human heart is dust, dryness, and death. But with the word of God, water in the heart, there is life, faith, and fruitfulness. So where there is the word, there is going to be life. And where that word is in your life, there is going to be spiritual change. There will be spiritual transformation. But where the word is not there, if that word is ignored or where it is rejected, then there's only going to be shriveled up, dry, dying faith that only leads to death. It's amazing that through his word, the living Lord comes to us right smack dab in the middle of our dryness, in the middle of our death. And he announces some things. Uh, God says, uh, seek me. But, But then he reveals himself to us in his word. God says, call upon me. But then he's the one in his word. He's the one who calls out to us. God says to the wicked man, he says, I I want you to turn from your your evil thoughts. But then God uh, uh, comes to us in his word and he creates a clean heart. And he gives us the mind of Christ. Uh, God says, forsake your evil ways. But then then he gives us his word and he guides us on paths of righteousness uh, for his name's sake. God says, you turn, turn to me, but only after he turned his face toward us and gave to us his favor and gave to us his peace. To uh, summarize this whole thing in, in one word, it's this. What God commands in his word, God then gives to us in his word. And how can I be certain of this? Because there is a God who said, I'm not wishy-washy. I, I don't uh, uh, flip-flop like so often you do in in your attitudes and in your emotions. God said, no, I am the God of absolute. So if I say something, then it is as good as done, right? June 25th, today, exactly six months away from, and didn't God, through the prophet Isaiah, even promise I'm going to, there's going to be a virgin and she's going to give birth to a child and you're to call his name Emmanuel. Christmas comes along and says, it is done. And his name is Jesus. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And, and therefore, if God could say that through the prophet Isaiah, that he also can make sure that this promise is also going to come true. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. Turn to our God, for he will freely pardon. See, that's a promise from God. It's as good as done. Why? Because God's pardon is found in the cross of Christ. And the message of of the cross comes to your hearts and minds through the living and the enduring word of God. Wherever God's word is heard and it's preached and it's taught. So think about that. This morning, what are we doing? We're simply here to hear the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord then this morning. And what about all the times that you uh, maybe are are seeking uh, something uh, from God? Then hear the word of the Lord.
the, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Hear the word of the Lord every time that you have a called out to someone. Why? But you're calling out. Is it because you call out to people in times of your problems? And then hear the word of the Lord when he says, Then come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Hear the word of the Lord uh, when he asks you to forsake. Forsake your evil ways when oftentimes all we do is live for evil ways. If you ever find evil lingering or loitering at the door of your heart, then hear the word of the Lord. Jesus, one time, he, he straightened up, and then he asked her, he said, he said, woman, where are those who, who condemn you? She answered, no one, sir. And Jesus then said, then neither do I condemn you. Now go and leave your life of sin. Hear the word of the Lord for those uh, to turn from your evil ways. And yet for the times when uh, oftentimes your life is so full of turmoil, then hear the word of the Lord when Jesus said, I tell you the truth, you will weep and you will mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve but your grief will turn to joy. Steve Jobs' absolutes, they were for gadgets and for Apple products. And they were so good, maybe some of you have them in your pocket even right now. And yet one thing that living by those absolutes, unfortunately, they couldn't save him. Steve Jobs died about six years ago, and he's buried in an unmarked grave. He died uncertain, and he died wishy-washy. And sometimes, when you look around uh, at churches, or you look around the world, and you see all the different flavors of Christian churches that are out there, and you get confused, and it even gets you questioning and doubting, doubting how can then there be absolutes of the faith, then I want you to remember that on this day, 487 years ago, in a town called Augsburg, there was a group of Lutheran forefathers that stood in front of one of the most powerful rulers of their time. And to this day, what they said is called the Augsburg Confession. And because of the Augsburg Confession, this church still embraces some of those absolutes. And do you know why? Because they are biblical absolutes. And here they are. We believe that, that sin is serious and God condemns us. And we also believe God's grace is real and freely forgives us. That is distinctive. That is absolutely Christian. And that is absolutely Lutheran. Stick to those absolutes. They are absolutely true. Amen.